Sovereign's a funny looking word, I'll tell you what. It's not like how it's spelled. That's what that happened. Oh side. my gosh. Yeah. Sorry, it's glitching. I know it's an animation. I don't know it's an animation. I'm not stupid. Well, good morning, South Sound family. <clears throat> good morning, Sound Sound family. Good morning, Sound Sound family. Good morning, Sound Sound family. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to extend an extra special welcome to you. I'm Pastor Rob Brower, lead pastor of South Sound Church. It's my honor to be with you guys this morning. And uh, we are in week two of a series titled Divine Interruptions. And so if you missed out last week, you can go back and catch that online. But I'll also pick you up with a quick recap here. Uh, we talked about how we know what divine interventions are. Sometimes divine interventions are things that we pray for. We say, God, we, we invite you into this space. We invite you into the situation. God, we need you to intervene because there's no other way. But there are times where we don't ask for God to intervene, but God will do it on our behalf anyway. And that's what we're calling a divine interruption. And so uh, the question that we're asking is basically, are we going to make space in our lives for God's inevitable divine interruptions? And last week we looked at Jesus as the interrupter. How he interrupted his disciples' lives was just these two simple words, follow me. Now we know that Jesus wasn't speaking English to the disciples, so it was probably more than two words, or maybe even fewer than two words. But in their tongue, it basically translated to, follow me. And he made them a promise, because they had a vocation as being fishermen, and he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So why are you recording? So in the essence, he was themselves? the subtext was listen, I'm gonna take this what you much. already have, it, what you already better. know how to do, and I'm gonna use it for my father's glory. And that's exactly what he did. So we looked at Jesus as the interrupter, and today we're gonna look at a moment where Jesus got interrupted. But before we do that, I want you guys to put your memory caps on. And I want you to think back, some of you may have to think back a ways, but think back to your childhood. I know that's pretty recent for some of us, but for some of us, it's way back then. We've got to dig deep. But think about when you were playing with your friends. And you were playing a game. And most games have rules. We have rules to decide how one wins or how one loses a game. And if you think back, and you think hard enough, you can probably picture that one friend who did not like to lose. They were often very competitive. But they were that one friend that would change the rules of the game. They'd initiate the game oftentimes and explain the rules fairly clearly so everybody understands. Hey, okay, we're going to play one-on-one -on -one basketball, and the first words make five baskets wins. And when you're up four to one, they go, okay, all right, here's the deal. But um, if you shoot from over here on this side of the baseline, that's worth four points. And then they immediately go and do it because that's the one shot they know they can make. And they're like, all right, I won. And you're like, that wasn't the rule. You changed the rule. That's a different game. You, in essence, ended our game in which I was severely beating you, and you started a new game with a new rule. That's not how this works. Now, some of you have a picture of somebody in mind. Some of you are thinking, oh, I remember who that was in my childhood. Some of you are like, I, I can't think of anybody. Here's a hint. If you can't picture anyone, it was probably you. I, I mean, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but maybe you're the one that changed the rules. And sometimes I think... I think this childhood rule changing followed us into the workplace sometimes. Because I think there are times where we're given expectations in our job and, and we're told, hey, if you do this, this, and this, then that's what you need to do to get a promotion. So you work diligently and you go to your boss and you're like, hey, boss, I did A, B, and C, and am I up for that promotion? And they go, yeah, well, here's the thing. And you're like, what? I did everything you asked me to do, and now somebody else is going to get the promotion that I worked so hard for? That just, it doesn't seem fair. You're, you're changing the rules. And if we're being honest, there are times in our lives where we make up rules where there is a lack of rules. I know that anybody who's raised a child or who's, who's taught know that children thrive when there is order. Right? Kids may want to run around, and they, they seem like they're agents of chaos, but they thrive when there is order. And you'll see it. Like, usually, kids would come over to our house to play, and I'd be one of the strictest parents on the block. Hey, get your feet off the furniture. We don't do that. 
No, no, no. You will ask. You will say, please and thank you. May I? Why are you just walking to my house? You don't just walk in somebody's house. You ask permission, right? And this isn't the way that the kids were raised in my neighborhood, but when they're in my house, they're going to follow my rules. That's the way I was. But you would think that, oh, man, Megan's dad is mean. I don't want to go over there and play. But no, exactly the opposite. They all wanted to come over and play. Knock on the front door. May we go in your backyard and play on the swing set? Yes, you may. Thank you for asking. Make sure to close the gate behind you. Kids thrive when there's structure and there's order. And so I think as children, we, we have this innate sense, of this need for order, because that's the way we're made. It's the way God made us. He's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. So we take that into our world. And I think there are times where there isn't order. And maybe subconsciously, we like to add order. We like to add the rules. And most of the time, it's not a problem. There's a bunch of people standing around trying to decide something. Four people get to a four-way intersection at the same time. And you go first. No, no, no. You go first. No, no, no. I insist. You go. So there's a rule. Did you know there's an order for that? It's called the right-of-way. You yield to the person on your right. Now, if it is a four-way intersection, everybody gets there at the same time, then you guys are on your own to figure that out. But there are rules for a reason. And I think there are times when we, in the lack of rules, we make up rules to whatever makes sense to us. But here's the problem with that. Whatever makes sense to us is based on our history, our experiences. So if we grew up and our parents had a rule for something that nobody else's parents had, then that becomes normal to us. For example, at our house, we do not wear shoes in the house. So when I come over to your house, I may kick off my shoes at the front door, and you might be like, that is weird. But for me, that's the rule. You don't wear shoes on the carpet. Make the carpet dirtier. I don't have a carpet, so it's fine. <laughs> but if you come over to my house, and you're wearing your shoes in my house, I might ask you nicely to up your shoes, please, if you don't wear shoes in the house. And most people are fine with that. Some people I go, oh, no, no, put your shoes back on, please, thank you. Um, <laughs> Mood. That you, I apologize. Feet syndrome that we're talking about. But there's a reason why we start making up the rules. And there are times, well, though, I think in our faith where what? there's a lack of rules. And so we make them up. Uh -huh. And I think okay. when it comes to our faith, there's a potential danger there. Because oftentimes the rules that we make up are based on assumptions. You see, God gave us all the rules he wanted us to follow. He made it pretty clear. Yet, I don't know why we tend to make it more difficult. God says, love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Manny. Go and do that. Hmm. This is my plan for salvation, to reconcile all of humanity as the church. So, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all the things that I have commanded you, all those rules, which particularly are summed up by love God and love others. But then, we start asking questions like, well, shouldn't we gather in a building? Well, how big should the building be? Well, we don't want the building to be too big. That would be offensive to God. So we, we want a kind of a modest building, but not too big of a building. I don't recall reading anywhere in the scriptures, and I've read all the scriptures. I don't recall reading anywhere where it says specifically how big your building should be. I don't recall reading anywhere where it says how big your church budget should be or how small it should be. I actually don't even recall reading that you should have a structure in which there is a lead pastor and a church board. But we make it up as we go along. And sometimes it's for logical reasons. Well, if we have a purely pastor-led church, I mean, that gives one person way too much power. The pastor has no oversight. He can do whatever he wants. That's not healthy. That's a potential danger there. So let's get some wise men and women who, who meet certain criteria. Let's create a board that can counsel the pastor. And if the pastor is out of line, they can say, whoa, 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 pastor, you're out of line there. And let's, uh, let's let the congregation help decide on things. So we'll have an annual business meeting, and we'll put it out to the congregation for a vote. And there's got to be a three-quarters majority vote in order for uh, something to pass. And we'll use Robert's Rules of Order. You know, the Bible says nothing about any of that. But we make it up as we go, don't we? 
Because we've seen organizations that don't have this type of a structure fall apart. So we want the church to be healthy. So we say, okay, what is a good model that we can follow as we make decisions that govern the church? So church governance, a lot of that is not specifically from the scriptures, but the scriptures tell us the way that we should think, the way that we should behave. It gives us criteria for what makes a good church leader. So if we follow those and we apply these rules of governance, it'll probably work out for the, for the best. But there are times when, even in the scriptures, we see where Jesus' disciples, the men that were closest to Jesus, I mean, they followed him around from city to city. They were homeless together, basically. But they, they went from town to town. They saw him performing miracles, doing the impossible. And yet, while they had him right there, and they could ask him, Jesus, what specifically do you want to do in the situation? They didn't always do that. Let's turn to, uh, to, to the book of Mark. If you've got your Bibles. If, if not, it'll be on the screen. But we're going to go to Mark chapter 10. And we're just going to look at a few verses here, 13 through 16. But what I love about this little passage is Jesus is going around and he's teaching. And his disciples have been going with him. And so this isn't the first time he taught. They know the deal. Jesus will walk along. and He'll be usually talking to the disciples, teaching them as they go. And he's like, well, this is what my father wants. And this is what I came here for. And, oh, here's a good spot. And he sits on a rock and he starts teaching. And crowds start gathering. And as the crowds start gathering, Jesus starts telling them these, these little insights into the kingdom of heaven. But then, in this particular instance, Mark 10, uh, verse 13, it says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. I'm pretty sure, it doesn't say so in the scriptures, but I'm pretty sure that as they were walking along, Jesus was like, oh yeah, and Peter, listen man, I'm going to need a bouncer, dude. Like, like you got that sword on you? Good, because... Uh, because people are going to try and bring their kids to me. And like, I don't want the kids near me, bro. They might mess up my Farrah Fawcett hairdo. <laughs> so they began rebuking them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. I don't know what was in the disciples' minds. I don't, it doesn't say who initiated it. I like to pick on Peter because I can relate to Peter. Peter often would act first and then think if at all later. Anybody else guilty of that or is it just me? Somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone. There's a few of us. Okay. The rest of you need to repent for lying. Repent. Okay. Done. Repent. But Done. sometimes we act just like Peter. <laughs> we think we know what's best based on the information that we have and based on our tradition and history and our experiences. And so we make a decision to snap judgment. Jesus doesn't want these kids to come. And so I imagine maybe oh it was Peter, God. Peter, if I'm Crazy. blaming you for something, and maybe it was John. I don't know. But okay. But I picture it was Peter. I imagine it was, hypothetically. And Peter's like, hey guys, 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 what's up with all these children? We gotta do something about it. And they go over there and they start to they form a front line. They're like, whoa, hey, 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 get that kid out of here, sir. We don't want none of these rug rats near the Lord. And Jesus was like, what are you doing? And not only does he stop them from doing it, he gives them instruction. Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You remember, we were just studying in our last series, Jesus was walking along and he was teaching the disciples what the kingdom of God was like. And it was very cryptic. And there were a lot of parables. He used a lot of farming analogies. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who goes out and sows feed and seed in his field. Okay. Well, the kingdom of God is kind of like a guy who... And, and they're like, we don't get it, Lord. Remember when they had him alone, they're like, Lord, what, what does all that mean? And he's like, my paraphrase, dude, you guys are with me like 24-7. You've heard me tell this like a thousand times. Do you not get it? Don't you get it? 
And this is another don't you get it moment. I believe Jesus is saying for the kingdom of God. Remember, I've been talking about that. I've been teaching about that. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, verily. See, the word that's translated there meant listen up. For what I'm about to tell you is of the utmost importance. So he says, truly, listen. Get this through your thick heads. I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. He doesn't say that we'll have difficulty entering. He says we'll never enter it. And he took the children in his arms. What a beautiful picture. These children that, that the, the disciples were trying to keep away from, he took them into them. He embraced them, placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. I'm sure some of these parents were bringing their kids to Jesus to be healed. Maybe there was a little kid there with a really, really thick Coke bottle glasses who had trouble seeing. I know they didn't exist back then. But I'm, I'm picturing this. <laughs> God, if, if Jesus would just lay hands on my kid. There's that, there's that one stay-at-home mom who was like, oh, my kid is just so wild. If Jesus would just calm him down a little bit. Oh, he's a good kid. He's just a little out of control. Maybe that's why the disciples were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't be bringing all your problems and all your kids' problems to the Lord. He's over here trying to teach. You're interrupting his Sunday school class. Picturing somebody walking into Miss Jane's class <laughs> in the middle of her teaching. Oh, no. What would Miss Jane do? Uh. <laughs> Stand silently and look at you and wonder what you want. But I'm pretty sure if a little kid walked in there and was like, Miss Jane, I need some prayer. She wouldn't be like, get out of here. I'm teaching class. She'd probably stop and pray for the kid. So he took the children in his arms, and he placed hands on them, and he blessed them. I mean, it's a small little bit of scripture, but it, it speaks volumes about who Jesus is, who the person of Jesus is, and how he values children. See, the scriptures tell us a lot of things about creation. They tell us that God reached down into the dust and formed Adam. And then he breathed his breath into Adam's nostrils, and then Adam became a living being. He then took a rib from Adam and he made Eve because there was no suitable helper to be found. And, and he charged them with taking care of the rest of creation. I had a pretty strong breeze. And we know about the fall and we know they messed up. So they're banished from the garden. But it doesn't change the fact that we are all made in the image of our creator. That every single one of us reflects the beauty of our heavenly father. And yes, the world beats us down and beats us up. And, and the enemy tries to tell us that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not pretty enough. But God tells us none of that matters. Because you are mine. And I created you. So far be it from us to, to take anybody and discriminate based on color, race, creed, gender, or age and say, you don't belong in the kingdom of God. It's for all of these people over here who meet this criteria, but for this segment over here, it's not for you. It's not for us to go to somebody who prays to a different God and say, you can't have access to our God. You're praying to a false God, so you don't deserve a relationship with your creator. It's not in the scriptures. We make those rules up. We say, if you live a certain lifestyle, you act a certain way, we don't want you to be part of this group. You do not belong. That's a made-up rule. Jesus gave us the rules. The Bible tells us that God desires that none should perish. He also tells us, and we read about this just a couple weeks ago, I didn't come here to heal the healthy. I came here to heal the sick. It's the sick who need a doctor. But why is it then? Why is it then that we feel so uncomfortable stepping out of our comfort zone and talking to the people that need Christ the most? If there are five people standing before us, and one of them's a Nazarene brother or sister from the Nazarene church down the road. They happen to be visiting our church today. And there's somebody who professes a Islam. There's somebody that votes the opposite of what we vote. There's somebody that grew up in the inner city that looks and acts and talks completely different than we do. 
will look at them and go, hey, brother, where are you joining us today from? Oh, yeah, I love that church. Good people. Go, go say hi to this person for me. And we'll preach to the choir. Brother, let me ask you something. How, how's your prayer life been? Let me pray with you. Let me, let me pray that God would increase that. How are you serving at your church, brother? Oh, really? You're not? Well, you know, the Lord wants us all to serve, so let me, let me pray for you. In the meantime, God has delivered to our doorstep somebody who is struggling with drugs. Addiction is their story. They don't know how to beat it. They're at their wit's end. And maybe their prayer was out of desperation, God, I don't want to go to this church, but I need help. Man, if you could just help me. They show up at our doorstep and we go, oh, hey, we don't want your kind around here. Take a hike, pal. Let me call 911. Security, stand in front of the door make sure this guy doesn't come back in, man. I heard a story about a pastor one time who was preaching a message on acceptance. And then he hired a new associate pastor. And before he announced it to the rest of the congregation, the associate pastor said, hey, I'm actually going to be there a week early. They were looking forward to meeting him the next week. He said, hey, I want you to do something. He said, I want you to get some clothes and just get them super dirty and stinky. And I want you to come like a homeless person. I want you to sit out front. Come before the service starts, just sit out front. Maybe have a little cup, beg for some money, see what happens. So his associate pastor does it. I mean, he just got hired. He's not going to say no to his boss. So he does it. Apparently he put on a good show. Deacons are in the back of the church talking about, man, what are we going to do about this homeless problem? I don't know. Does this guy stay the night on our front stoop? I don't know. Man, did you catch a whiff of that? He stinks. In the middle of the sermon, the associate was uh, directed to come in and walk right down the aisle. He had pews very similar to this, I'm sure. So as the, as the pastor's preaching, this guy's walking down the aisle. And the pastor doesn't say anything. He's just going on with the message. And pretty soon, a couple of the deacons are looking at each other, making head motions. Hand signals like a SWAT team. I don't know what that means. But they knew what it meant. And before you know it, there's this wall of deacons in front of this homeless guy saying, Listen, pal, you're interrupting the, the, the service. You got to go. The pastor stopped him and said, Hey, hold up. Come here. And he embraces this dirty, filthy, stinky man and he hugs him. The deacons are all looking at him dismayed, like, what is going on here? Pastor, why would you do that? And he says, let me, let me tell you something. You guys don't know this. This is Pastor so-and-so. He's our new associate pastor. He starts next week. But I gave him a task today. He shamed the congregation a little, which, eh, I'm a little weary of. But it made the point. He said, when you guys thought he was homeless... When you thought he was down on his luck, when you thought he was poor and he had nowhere to go, no food to eat, no money to spend, no place to lay his head, rather than take pity on him, rather than step in and say, hey, brother, here's a few bucks. Hey, man, why don't you come inside? It's warm inside. Hey, why don't you grab a seat? The pastor's about to share a message. Maybe it'll bless you. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Instead, you wanted to turn him away because you decided, you made up a rule that the kingdom of heaven doesn't belong to such as these. That the kingdom of heaven had to be in their three-piece suit with a nice silk tie, rode up in their nice $40,000, $60,000 car, parked in two spaces so it wouldn't get dinged. Is that what the kingdom of God looks like? If so, God help us all. And that's exactly what the disciples did when they tried to keep the children from coming to Jesus. They made up in their mind who the kingdom of heaven belonged to. Lest I remind them that just months prior, they were stinky, dirty fishermen. They weren't looked to as high society. They smelled like fish because they handled fish all day. And apparently they weren't even that good at fishing because Jesus said, hey, let's go out, let's fish. They cast their nets and yeah, a couple fish here and there, not enough to feed anybody's family. Jesus said, cast your net over here. I'm like, who is this rabbi? 
I mean, he's lucky we took him out on our fishing boat. I mean, it was more of a courtesy thing because he's a rabbi, but, but let's indulge this crazy rabbi. All right, we'll drop our nets over here where the fish don't like to gather. And then there were so many fish that it started sinking their boats and they needed help from the other boats. Jesus knew what was coming down the road. He's saying, look, just like when you were fishing for fish, you did it your way. I showed you a better way, and you saw the results. Your way is to keep certain people out of the kingdom and allow certain people in to play, to play kingdom bouncers. And if you do that, you'll have a little haul. But if you do it my way, if you cast your net where other people aren't even dreaming to cast their net, if you just obey instead of making up rules, then you will catch so many fish that you're going to need help. Church, imagine if we did that. As we look around, there's, there's plenty of seating. We shouldn't keep people out for fear that we're going to lose our seat. Last time I checked, there wasn't a signed seating. Although for 50 bucks a month, if you want to increase your tithe, I'll put your name on a seat. I'm not above that. Hey, got to do what you got to do. I kid. But seriously, there's plenty of room. Who are we inviting to come with, if at all? And if we're not inviting people to come join us, then why not? It's not the healthy that need the doctor, it's the sick. So are we out there going where the sick are? Are we interacting with people that need Christ? Because that's what we're called to do. Some of these people were bringing their children to Jesus probably because they wanted a blessing. It was a big deal in that culture. For a rabbi to bless your child. To have God's presence prayed into your kid. Some of us are like, let's keep doing that, Pastor. Why do we stop? I'll bring my kid over right now. And in, in the disciples' mind, the kids were taking up Jesus' valuable time. I'm sure they were on a timeline because, remember, they had to walk everywhere. And if their destination was still five hours walk away and they see the, the noontime sun starting to get a little lower than the horizon, they're getting a little worried. They didn't have flashlights back then. I don't know how many torches they carried around. Yes. Missed. They yeah. thought it was a waste of Jesus' time. But Jesus told them, no, exactly the opposite. It says he was indignant. And it's the only time in the gospel that that word is used to describe Jesus' attitude. When Jesus flipped tables, there was a different word. It's, it means righteous anger. But this indignant, Jesus, it was almost like a disbelief. I can't believe that you would act this way. The kingdom of God belongs to people who, like these children, come with an open heart and trust in Jesus. We see Jesus extend a warm, authentic invitation to the kids as he takes them in his arms and he blesses them. One commentary says, The disciples viewed the children as individuals unworthy of Jesus' attention, but Jesus saw them as important in their own right and possessing important qualities that adults need to cultivate. I spent a lot of years as a youth pastor. And I can tell you one of the things that really irked me as a youth pastor were people who saw the, the, the youth as a distraction to the kingdom. They saw me as a glorified babysitter. They'd ask questions like, so what do you do? You just hang out and play with teens all day? Is that what you think I do? Because let me tell you. I'll tell you what I did this week. Got up early in the morning, spent some time with the Lord, asking him, what do you want me to teach these teens in the, in the coming weeks, months? Studied the Bible, prepared not one, not two, but three messages. Because I had to preach Sunday morning, I had to preach Wednesday night for youth group, and then I had a young adults uh, group that was coming in, and I had to preach a message to them. I might have in that week prepared four messages because I was asked to, to speak at the chapel at Northwest Christian High School. 
And then I got a call one morning from a kid bawling his eyes out saying, Pastor, I need to talk to you. Are you available? I said, you know what? I was doing some stuff, but come on over, man. He comes over and he explains to me that he was sitting at an intersection getting ready to drive to school. And as he was sitting at that intersection, he saw his friend opposite the intersection. They waved. And then he watched his friend pull into traffic as a truck t bone <clears throat> And he didn't know how to process that. So I sat there for hours letting this kid just cry on my shoulder. And I wept with him because I didn't know what else to say. I encouraged him. Let him know that Christ is here with us. That I'm here for him. And if he needs to talk, I'm here. my message a kid comes up after the message and says hey so I kind of want to accept Jesus but I don't know if I can I said why not and they tell me what they're struggling with they're struggling with self harm and they want to stop but they don't know what to do and I said we got to have a talk with your parents so I said I set up an appointment with their parents I said we got to talk about this important issue give them numbers to call for counseling and whatnot. That's how my week is going so far. Because the youth aren't the church of tomorrow. They're, they're not a bother. They are part of the church today. They are the church leaders of tomorrow. But if we keep them from Jesus, and if we tell them, you are not a part of the church yet, how are they going to learn? How are they going to grow in their faith? Who's going to show them? You've got to remember, Jesus commanded us to make disciples, not new converts. He said, make disciples. If the scripture had said, make believers of all nations, that would be a different thing. Because then we just open the doors wide and we just start blasting the message of Jesus everywhere until people believe. Once they pray the prayer and they get baptized, we're done with them. Make room for somebody else. We're crowded. Get out of our way. You're a believer. Go. No. He doesn't say that. He said make disciples. What does that look like? Get the fuck out. It looks like intentionally investing in people. Sharing what you've learned. Sharing the mistakes that you've made so they may not make the same mistakes potentially. Helping people to go closer to Christ become more Christ-like so when they go out in turn to make disciples that they'll be able to do the same thing. Our mission is clear. We're here to know Christ and to make him known. How are we going to make Christ known if we don't know who he is? How are we going to know who he is if we don't spend time with him, if we don't read about him? We're here to grow disciples who grow disciples. It's not enough to just teach a man to fish. We've got to give him the tools so he can continue fishing and let him catch the vision so he can teach others how to fish as well and give them the tools so that they can continue to do so. You need your nuzzle and the parts in your body. It's really weird. And finally, it's to show the love of Christ to our community and beyond. Folks, if we just do these three things and we do them well, no grow and show there's no telling how wide God will open the floodgates there's no telling how many people he'll pack these pews with I'm excited about that not just for the sake of numbers so I can report back to the district yes we have 400 people sitting in our service but because every single one of those people is a life story a life story that got divinely interrupted when Jesus entered their life and we could be a part of that story that excites me. That someday, fast forward 20, 30, 40 years, somebody goes sitting in a pew here, listening to a message, and afterwards they'll be in fellowship out in the foyer, and somebody asks them, so tell me, how did you come to South Sound Church? How did you become a part of the South Sound family? Ah, crazy story. The man named Gordy just started a conversation with me. I was standing in line at a restaurant, and this guy, Lenny, started speaking to me. Oh, I met this gal, Lois, at the bank. And she invited me. My old bus driver, Mr. Lundeen, he was always so nice to me. So we went to church with his family one day. See what I'm getting at? If we do it right, 
if we go out into the world and we're in the world and not of the world. We take the light of Christ into the darkness that is out there because believe me, it is dark. But Christ encourages us. We don't need to fear the darkness because he has overcome the darkness. So let's not change the rules. Let's try obeying them and see where that gets us instead. And as we obey and we teach others to obey, let's let God prove himself faithful. Let's let him add to our numbers daily those that are being saved. Not so that we can sit back and go, look how cool we are. But so that we can look at God and say, look how amazing our God is. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much.